Welcome to Inner Compass. I'm Karen Salpi. My guest today says that the era of the religious right in America is over. If that's true, where did they go? To the left? Jim Wallace will talk to us today about the moral center he believes is at the heart of a new awakening. Join us on Inner Compass. From the campus of Calvin College, this is Inner Compass, exploring how people use faith and ethics to guide them through critical issues of today. My guest today is Jim Wallace, founder of Sojourners, a global faith and justice network and magazine. He's also author of the New York Times bestseller, God's Politics, and the more recent sequel, The Great Awakening, Reviving Faith and Politics in a Post-Religious Right America. Welcome, Jim. Great to be here. You wrote God's Politics several years ago, uh, expressing frustration about the limited, the two-party choices in, in American politics. And this more recent book, you say everything's changed since then. Well, here's a newsflash. God is not a Republican or a Democrat. Right, right. <laughs> and people of faith belong in no party's political pocket. And there was a lot of confusion last time. Um, if you go into the average newsroom and ask a journalist, uh, what are the religious issues? Mm -hmm. In 2004, they would have said gay marriage and abortion. Right. The, End the, of story. The, 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 <laughs> the very focused agenda yeah. of the religious right. But now I was on uh, Soledad O'Brien, her CNN morning show, mm -hmm. was on last week, and she said, so, Jim, uh, now the religious issues are like poverty and HIV AIDS and the environment and war and peace. That's a big change. <laughs> mm, yeah. Well, it's the agenda is broader and deeper. Sure. And, for example, uh, many of us care about the sanctity of life but now a more consistent ethic of mm -hmm. life where all the threats to human life are important. 30,000 children died again yesterday mm -hmm. because of what Bono calls stupid poverty and so utter, utterly preventable disease yeah. that my five and 10 year old boys and their friends will never die of. Mm -hmm. That's a life issue too, mm -hmm. as is this alarming abortion rate. So I think we're in a much better place to talk about a broader agenda. And uh, you know, we, we got to hold both sides accountable here. I mean, there's selective moralities on the left and the right. True. Yeah. And we have to really be more prophetic than partisan. We shouldn't be cheerleaders for any side. Mm -hmm. And so I think the silliness that God is on one side of the aisle or another is finally over. And the monologue of the religious right is over, and now it's a dialogue, and that's a good thing. So, so you're not, it, it's not that you now have uh, promoted the religious left as an alternative or something, but what you're saying is really those terms aren't useful to us anymore. When I first did this book, the first interview was John Stewart, and mm -hmm. he asked your question. He okay. said, so, Jim, you want to do a religious left now? Mm. And I said, uh, you know, that'd be a mistake, because the country isn't hungry for a religious left to replace a religious right. They're hungry, I, I call it, a, for a new moral center. Not a, a, a soulless centrism or a mushy middle, mm -hmm. but don't go left, don't go right, go deeper. What are the moral choices and challenges right beneath our political debate? Isn't that, have you encountered a lot of resistance? I mean, I, I, I've yes. had so many conversations <laughs> with people who, who are so firmly entrenched in their political position as the only possible manifestation of, of their moral values, of their Christian, of their religious values, whatever their faith may be. In the last election in this country, I knew Christians who felt pushed out of their churches because they were Democrats, mm -hmm. or were going to vote for a Democrat. Sure. So that kind of political orthodoxy is not theologically grounded. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember when I was in seminary, I was banned from speaking at a Christian college whose name I won't mention, it wasn't here, because I was opposed to the war in Vietnam. Uh, Senator Mark Hatfield, mm -hmm. who, was an, who, who is an evangelical Christian, was in the Senate, and he was also opposed to the war in Vietnam. He got letters that said, Dear Former Brother in Christ. Sure. So let's talk about you know, what it means to be uh, a follower of Jesus Christ and then say, what does that mean mm -hmm. for our lives and for our neighborhoods and for our nation and for our world? And, and I hope that we can see these political choices always as imperfect, important, but imperfect. Right. The, this notion of, uh, of uh, partisan faith really doesn't fit the prophetic and independent uh, integrity of the Christian community. How do you, th why did the religious right get so stuck on, and, and it was really, gay marriage and abortion, um, 
why fixate on those two things? Not that those two things aren't important, but why those two and not everything else, do you, do you think? Well, the religious right was a political creation of political operatives in one party who saw the chance of uh, taking genuine convictions, mm -hmm. but also fears and exploiting them as wedge issues. Uh, uh, you know, I I have been I spoke at both conventions and mm -hmm. I talked in both places about the need for a serious abortion reduction. Yeah, you, I noticed Neither in your book is, you always talk about that. abortion reduction. You don't talk about changing laws. You don't talk about well, making it legal or I illegal, but you talk about reducing the number of abortions. Talk about that because that's kind of a pragmatic. It, well, one side just talks about a woman's right to choose mm -hmm. as if there's no other issue. Yeah. The other side says let's just make it illegal, and they privately tell you it's never going to happen. Yeah. So let's talk about dramatic reduction in the abortion rate by, well, I met a woman at a book table recently and she said, my daughter's graduating from Harvard. She was so excited. Um, uh, and I said, that's great. I teach there part time. I thought that's why she was telling me. It's mm -hmm. a great school. You should be proud. She said, yeah, but when I was pregnant, I was a single uh, low income mom. And if I didn't have food stamps or Medicaid, mm -hmm. I would have aborted my child and a tear yeah. came down her face I would have aborted my daughter tell people my story mm -hmm. tell them my story mm -hmm. if we don't support low-income women we don't work on unwanted pregnancies if we don't work on making adoption much easier and more friendly and less expensive uh, you know we're, we're not being pro-life you know I, so you how do we make a difference in what really happens and not just have this screaming shouting match right. about the law Right. You're, I mean, again, it's always sort of baffled me that, that people would look at uh, changing the law will change people's behavior. And in some cases, I'm sure, I, I know that laws sometimes are deterrents, but it's always seemed to me that in the background, the, the, the causes, and, and you pin this again and again to poverty, the causes of people needing or wanting to have right. abortions, the causes of people committing other kinds of crimes, um, are so deep rooted. Well, three quarters of the uh, of, of women who have abortions say it's 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 it's, it's largely due to they can't afford the, the child. Okay. Three quarters. That's so it's amazing. not. A, I mean, we hear the argument sometimes that it, that there are lots of wealthy women who just don't want to well, be inconvenienced. Well, that's that's part of it too. Yeah. And I think there there are real ethical. I mean, this is a moral issue. Mm -hmm. But you know, you got to change the culture. Mm -hmm. You know, culture has to change. Mm -hmm. And then I think uh, you know, uh, policy normally changes after culture does. And so let's start with changing culture and behaviors and, and, and attitudes. And I, I met a woman the other day, she said, uh, she was giving me my, my annual physical checkup. She was the, the, the nurse and she said, uh, you know, I, I don't want to take away anybody's rights necessarily, but I want people to see abortion is important. Mm -hmm. I, have low, I have teenage girls who are pregnant come and live with us. Mm -hmm. Uh, so they can take their child to term. That's yeah. that's pro life. Yeah. Yes. You know? Exactly. And she's not kind of you know trying to rant and rave on people who are in desperate, difficult, tragic situations, mm -hmm. but th we're not offering alternatives. So right. here again, left and right, scream back and forth. Let's get something done. Uh, poverty should be uh, fighting poverty should be a nonpartisan issue mm -hmm. and a bipartisan cause. Mm -hmm. uh, creation care. Some issues transcend. Uh, partisan politics, the big issues, True. and they usually transcend the issues <laughs> where God's involved somehow. Well, how much, when you get to the practicalities of this, though, I think both parties, all sides would agree that poverty is a bad thing, we should eradicate it, but then the, the political platforms differ in what's the best way to go about this. How do you, how do you mediate those arguments? There's a whole section in the book about those who say, um, well, uh, we've got to change culture and family structure and behavior and personal responsibility. Mm -hmm. And I say, yes. Other side says, we've got to have affordable health care mm -hmm. and, and, and affordable housing. Uh, work has to work. I mean, you know, there are nine million American families where the, somebody in the household is working full time mm -hmm. and they're still raising their kids in poverty. Mm -hmm. okay? And I say yes to that. So personal and social responsibility. It's got to be the job of the faith community, mm -hmm. the business community, labor, the nonprofit sector, and government. You talk about this three-legged school, that, that yeah. uh, uh, three-legged school, sure. all these parties have to participate. Hurricane in Katrina mm -hmm. hits. Churches were the first and best and most effective responders. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But churches can't rebuild levees. Right. 
or provide health insurance for 47 million Americans. We can't do that. Mm -hmm. So it's got to be, uh, you know, what does, do, what does each of us do best? And what's our role? What's our part mm -hmm. in all this? So it's partnerships, it's alliances. And, you know, uh, we, our book talks about William Wilberforce, yes. the slave trade. Well, Wilberforce didn't say, it's okay, Christians just shouldn't have slaves. Right. He said we have to end the slave trade, mm -hmm. a structural issue. Mm -hmm. uh, now, there were millions of decisions that Christians made not to put sugar in their coffee and tea, because it was made by slaves on Jamaican plantations mm -hmm. that made Wilberforce possible. King didn't say, I just want Christians not to practice discrimination. Though he also said 11 o'clock Sunday morning is our most segregated hour in America. Yes. Still yes. is. Still is. But he said, we need a civil rights law to protect us. Mm -hmm. A voting rights act. So how do you change lives and then neighborhoods mm -hmm. and culture and then public policy. Right. You, you talk quite a bit in the book about needing not simply to change the officials you elect or change their minds, but, but to, because they're always going to reflect the will of the people you say, you have to change the way the wind's blowing. Change the wind, yeah. Because yeah. politicians, they're walking around mm -hmm. D.C. with their sure. fingers up in the air yeah. to see which way the wind's blowing. And, and, uh, and in a way, that's what they're elected to do. Yeah. They're meant, if and, they're going to represent me, they need to know what I think. Exactly. And Dr. King understood, Gandhi knew, you don't change a nation by replacing just one wet-fingered Paula with another. Mm -hmm. You change the wind, it's amazing how quickly they'll re respond. Sure. And, and so, I mean, I know politicians who will do the right thing even if it costs them their next election. Mm -hmm. I do. Oh, yeah. But I don't need even two hands to count all the ones like that that I've met. The rest want to do the right thing, they mm -hmm. really do. But unless there's a sense of public momentum and change, they, they won't. Mm -hmm. Lyndon Johnson wasn't a civil rights leader until Martin King and Rosa Parks made him one. So what I'm talking about is how politics is broken. Yeah. And it's not solving our biggest issues. So that's when social movements rise right. up, change politics. And the best ones always have, the book talks about this, spiritual foundations. These great awakenings. Everyone you talk about three awakenings. big ones. What triggers those? Is it, is it just mounting discontent and restlessness? <sighs> or are there specific events? Or how, how do you start one? And, yeah. and you say there's one underway. I do. I, I mean, I've been at this for a few decades now. And I sense more momentum. Mm -hmm that I've ever felt, particularly a younger generation, they want their faith mm -hmm. uh, to be real and their lives to make a difference. I think you're right, and, I, and, and the college-age students that I work with and the camp counselors that I work with, I see so many of them going into volunteer organizations and looking for careers and mm -hmm. vocations that are going to mean something uh, in a way that I think my generation, w it was a much smaller percentage mean of people. Mean something is yeah. exactly the right language. What I hear when I ask them why they're doing this, mm -hmm. why why they're volunteering more than is necessary for a balanced resume. Right, right. <laughs> the two words I get back are meaning and connection. Yeah. We're looking for meaning and looking for connection. Shopping doesn't satisfy the deepest longings of the human they heart. need community. And they want something more. Mm -hmm. So I think that kind of service ethic and volunteering then can go to movement uh, because you can't keep pulling bodies out of the river and not go upstream to see what or who is throwing them in. Yeah. So how do movements change big things? I think they happen when, when, when there are big things, I mean really big moral issues mm -hmm. that politics isn't resolving or even addressing. And then I think it's sparked by, by faith. I think uh, I can talk about historical causalities with Wilberforce and King and Gandhi, but at some level, you know, these are movements of the spirit. I mean, these things that, 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 that God does. Do you think that uh, political arguments are more passionate when they stem from faith con convictions, that, 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 that the stakes are somehow higher? I mean, again, I'm thinking about arguments about what, what has caused this problem. How, do we, how we solve it is determined partly by what we believe has caused it. So how do you go back to the beginning? The Israeli-Palestinian conflict, where do you start that story? Where you start that story will determine a bit who you think has a right to be in what lands, right? Uh, well, there are, there are two conflicting narratives here. Right. Uh, the same thing with, um, with um, uh, uh, the Iranians and the Americans yes. now. If you go to Iran and talk to Iranians, everything starts with um, when we overthrew uh, an elected government and mm -hmm. put the Shah in, who mm -hmm. was a brutal dictator. Mm -hmm. Our narrative starts when they took when our they, people hostage. Yes. 
You know, yeah. these are conflicting narratives. They're both true. Right. So how do you? So uh, I've I've been with Israelis and Palestinians, mm -hmm. uh, on in their conflict zone, mm -hmm. who are sharing their narratives back and forth. Yeah. And that's the hope. That's the hope. Politics here just says there's only one narrative. Right. My narrative. I don't want to hear the other one. But the world is more complicated than that. So how do, particularly people of faith, how do we get the conflicting narratives at the table here mm -hmm. and have a conversation? Because I think if we don't, uh, one narrative, whichever one has the most guns, is the one that wins for a while. Sure. Because you're not solving the underlying problem. Right. We, I mean, traditionally, I think we've tried to bully the other side into submission. Perhaps. Yeah, as if uh, I, I was talking to... Um, uh, a group of Brits about um, uh, the, the prophet Micah. And I was saying, we've got to make a choice here uh, on national security. It's either the prophet Micah or Donald Rumsfeld. Hmm. And I just quoted them both, their own words. Justice, no, love, no mercy, and walk humbly with our God. Well, Micah says, if you want to beat your swords into plowshares, mm -hmm. your spears into pruning hooks, uh, you've got to worry about people having their own vines and their own fig trees mm -hmm. so nobody can make them afraid. Hmm. Uh, Rumsfeld was saying, uh, our military su uh, supremacy, hegemony is the only road to security. These are conflicting mm -hmm. visions. Mm -hmm. Afterwards, um, a guy wanted coffee with me, a uh, charismatic Christian. He said, I'm a major general in the British Army. I've just come back from Iraq. I was in charge of the occupation for my government. I was number two under your Bremer, your number, number wow. one. And I want to tell you, that Micah is right and Rumsfeld is wrong. My. So it's not a matter of you know, high-minded ideals, it's what works, you know, what really works I mean, on And that's the interesting, I talked to a, a young man back from, a soldier back from Iraq not too long ago and he, he said wh where they were working, they were getting to know the people in the community, he felt like they were making a big difference, um, but, but the work he was doing there was not military work per se he was he was building and 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 he was spending time with children spending time with working people and it was the bridge building part of that that was really effective so he came back with a very positive attitude about our military presence there but it wasn't it wasn't um battles that, that he was fighting well, yeah i mean wouldn't it have been great to see our military rescuing the people of new orleans mm -hmm. after katrina that was pled for on the inside in the White House. Hmm. Uh, there are Christians pleading for that inside the White House, and it was rejected. Wow. You know, the military uh, could, could take on very different kind of roles, and I think there's a real possibility for, you know, we need peacekeeping mm -hmm. in the world. Mm -hmm. I'd like to, you know, send some of those folks to Darfur right now. Mm -hmm and protect the people who are being ravaged by the Janjaweed, by these, yeah. these thugs, by the Sudanese, Su Sudanese gar gar government's got these, these thugs, yes. and, and, and we got nobody to sort of stand in their way. To stop, yeah. And usually when there's bullies involved, just showing up makes them run away. Hmm. So you don't have to bomb Baghdad. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's the collateral damage yes. that, that really is right. the problem. Too many people who had nothing to do with 9-11 uh, they're innocent too, and mm -hmm. they've suffered the consequences of our blowback. Mm -hmm. So, how do you be? How do you be uh, not just uh, uh, you know moral and just, but smart mm -hmm. about how to defeat these these threats of terrorism? Not by not by Abu Ghraib and Guantanamo and rendition sites and mm -hmm. too much collateral damage. You you become recruiting mm -hmm. posters mm -hmm. for this murderous agenda. You talk about. Conservative radicals is, is the phrase you use for what you want Christians to be. Uh, tell me more about that. Well, we make these false choices. Yeah. Uh, conservative, I'm a conservative evangelical mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. I, my theology is very conservative. I'm not a theological liberal. I'm really not. Mm -hmm. Never have mm -hmm. been. Uh, conservative means to be rooted someplace, yeah. you know, to have grounding, to be anchored, to have a tradition, to have a, yeah. a place where you stand, where things don't change. But then, to be radical is to want to uh, to really address root causes and to change the world so based both on both about roots that tradition. They're both about roots, mm -hmm. exactly. In fact, radical is you know, radix mm -hmm. means roots. So, so they're both about being rooted someplace. Um, and um, I, you know, Dorothy Day, the Catholic worker, was a hero of mine. She was a very devout conservative Catholic. Mm -hmm. 
and it made her just take care of poor people all day mm -hmm. and resist war and all kinds of radical things. Mm -hmm. uh, Martin King was rooted in the black church tradition, a conservative tr tradition. And out of that came this, this movement, uh, this freedom movement. So it's to be rooted someplace, but have a, want to get to the root causes of mm -hmm. what's wrong with the world. Okay. Uh, you say that faith community should be the ultimate swing vote. <laughs> well, I think in a sense, whether we're registered one, one way or the other, we ought to be independent in our mm -hmm. behavior. I mean, and that implies a kind of not unpredictability, maybe unpredictability yeah, from I, part I of the politicians. I think there, there's, yeah. a, there's a nice thing about being not predictable politically. I'm comforted you know. by that because I've been told that I'm not consistent in my political views. You. And <laughs> I'm not sure I want to be. Yeah. Well, you know, Tony Campolo says, are you a liberal or are conservative? He says, depends what issue you're talking yes. about. Yeah. So I think there's a way that we've got to really apply our, our faith, our moral compass, our Christian ethics to politics in imperfect choices. Mm -hmm. And my experience is you're always uh, uh, giving both sides a bit of a hard time. When I get attacked by the left and the right, which I do on a regular basis, yeah. uh, well, sometimes I'm probably deserving of the attacks, <laughs> but sometimes I think maybe when I'm getting it from both sides, maybe I'm maybe you've got to onto just something them. here. That mm -hmm. is so so I, I think we've got, wouldn't it be, be nice if we were in a, a block within a party a reliable, dependable voting bloc, but rather people saw us as th that they have to win our vote, if you will, our votes, by their response to, to our agenda. Mm -hmm. That's what I liked about King. He didn't endorse a candidate ever. Yeah. He made them nor endorse, do you. Uh, nor do I, he made them endorse the agenda of a movement. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's okay to advise. I advise both sides. I, whoever calls, I talk to. But I think it's important not to be a surrogate for one side or the other, but to, but to try to maintain that prophetic distance. How much does that involve compromising your values? I'm thinking of voters who get absolutely stuck on, let's say, an, an, an issue like, uh, like abortion rights or, or uh, the right to life or the right to choose, which it's always interesting to me that those are both very positive positions. But um, you know, can you get so stuck on that one issue that maybe the candidate, you've got two candidates and one of them agrees with 90% of what you want, but not that one thing that's so important to you. Mm -hmm. What do you advise a voter to do then? Well, I think uh, the single issue voting is often difficult. Do you give somebody, let's say someone takes your view on abortion, do you give them a, a pass on endless on wars, yeah. on Iraq and Iran and Syria and mm -hmm. wherever? Uh, does it matter what happens for, with climate change? which is a life issue insofar it's affecting and going to affect a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So we need to be a little more, uh, you know, Cardinal Bernadine, the Catholic Cardinal of Chicago, I really miss him, my favorite Cardinal, he talked about a seamless garment of life, a consistent ethic of life, where nuclear weapons were an issue, along with abortion, mm -hmm. poverty, uh, pandemic diseases which ravage continents, uh, uh, the environment. These are all life issues. So we've got to get out of the kind of political posturing and talk about a vision that really is voting all of our values. I do. Not just I mean, it seems like underneath all this, and and I guess for a Christian, you you, you would go to the Bible for this for this mm -hmm. ideal vision. Underneath all this is something coherent. But I, I wonder if people become one issue voters because they're so overwhelmed by all the issues there are. I think I think that's true. I also think there's real there's real political strategy. Mm -hmm. aimed at people of faith. In, in partisan, highlighting one oh, value. Oh, it's partisan political strategy mm -hmm. to, to kind of rub, rub raw the edges of discontent, of frustration. Uh, a lot of, 80% of the country say we're not happy with the direction. There's a hunger for change. Mm -hmm. And yet those who don't want much change, I mean, it's either going to be, we either vote on our hopes or on our fears. Mm -hmm. These elections more and more are about hope versus fear. Sure. You know, you want to, I hope this could be different or better, or I'm afraid that this could happen. Mm -hmm. And so I always say, listen to who's appealing to hope and listen who's appealing to fear and pay attention to those very different motivations here. And you would vote for hope? I think so. I mean, that's, you got to be, all, there are real dangers in the world, all that, mm -hmm. be, be, sure. be prudent. Mm -hmm. But finally, I think, uh, Desmond Tutu used to say, as Christians, we are prisoners of hope. You know, it means that we always, we know who wins in the end. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and we want to base our lives and our, our public engagement and even our voting 
on how this could be a better world today, tomorrow than today. Mm -hmm. And when fear is the motivation, it's, we, you know, fear is, uh, Thomas Merton, the Trappist monk said, the root of war is fear. Yes. You know, and so that kind of fearful foreign policy is usually not a smart foreign policy. Uh, uh, when you love your en enemies, it doesn't mean you submit to their agendas. It just means you recognize that they too possess the Im image of God and, uh, and you neither torture them nor submit to their agendas. But how do you be smart? How do you, how, how do you, uh, you, know, you know, Romans talks about love your enemies by heaping burning coals on mm -hmm. them. What have we fed the nations mm -hmm. that were most um, volatile? where these agendas are most, are most active. What if we were the ones who were actually rebuilding, uh, helping them rebuild mm -hmm. uh, their broken, torn, destroyed nations? Uh, we have a very different image in the world. Thank you for your ideas, your thoughts, and your work. My guest today has been Jim Wallace, founder of Sojourners and author of The Great Awakening, Reviving Faith and Politics in a Post-Religious Right America. I'm Karen Salpi. Thank you for watching Inner Compass.